Uh, so I was asked to uh, help write an article at the beginning that really is trying to maybe start that conversation that Dennis is talking about. Because I think we all agree that you know the future of food is so instrumental to the future of our civilization, to the future of our planet. And I'm an environmental scientist, so I'll show you later why I care so much about food as it impacts the environment. But if you really want to start with the whole big conversations around food, we have to confront many issues, many, many issues. And I'm only going to mention three. These are just three big ones, but there are others, of course. But one that others will speak to later today, much more than I will, is the need for feeding the world today. That is, uh, was mentioned earlier, we have just over 7 billion people, but nearly a billion people today are not adequately nourished and face food insecurity. That's not a problem of agriculture and agronomics per se, it's really an issue of our poverty around the world and institutions, land tenure, governance. It's largely a political and institutional problem. But as we think about the future, we will see increasing demands on our food system. Part of that is population growth. That's a you know, 30 to 35% increase in just the number of people between now and mid-century, assuming nothing else changes. But the big uh, kind of elephant in the room is essentially a cow, right? Uh, we're eating more meat as three to four billion people on the planet already are eating richer and richer, higher and higher up of the food chain kind of diets. So that's why if nothing were to change, the demand for food will probably increase from population growth, but also dietary affluence. Of course, I'm gonna argue later is that we can change those things, and we probably cannot double our way to growing twice as much food. We're gonna to have to figure out how to curb some of that demand as well. And third, we have to think about agriculture as it impacts the environment and the sustainability of agriculture. And this is important because agriculture is just so vast. Uh, this is a map showing the extent of agriculture on the planet today. It's about 38% right now of all the land there is on Earth. If you were to double the amount of food grown in the world, if you were to try to do that, you would run out of land very quickly that could ever grow anything. And right now we're even putting pressure on tropical rainforest, which is a huge environmental problem. Also, agriculture is by far the biggest consumer of water on the planet. Of even what we call water withdrawals, it's 70% of all the water we move on the planet is used for one thing, irrigating crops. So we use much of the world's land, most of our water, and even the contributions to climate change are very large when it comes from agriculture. Usually we think of climate change as purely a problem of energy and burning fossil fuels, and it largely is. But it turns out, once again, agriculture looms large. About 30% of all the contributions to climate change that we produce as a civilization come from agriculture, mostly from deforestation, methane produced by cattle and rice fields, and nitrous oxide when we over-fertilize our fields. So in this article, we kind of talked about those three big problems. And again, there are many more. We're just starting the conversation. This is just a beginning. And we talked about five kind of areas where you might begin to explore some solutions. Again, uh, there are more solutions here too, but here are some to maybe start the conversation with. One that we talked about a lot was the need to really stop deforestation, the clearing of land that's rich in biodiversity, rich in carbon and rich with water, and clearing those to produce food mainly for the world's middle class, not the world's poor, is a bad trade-off. It's bad for the environment, and it's not really contributing to food security. So this is kind of a lose-lose proposition. What can we do if we avoid deforestation? Can we grow more nutrition and deliver more nutrition on the land we already have? Or even better yet, could we do it on even less land and restore some into nature? Well, it turns out there are opportunities to do this. We talk a lot about this in agriculture today, the idea of yield gaps, that there are many places in the world, uh, some due to poverty and in institutions, some due to governance issues, where yields could be much higher than they are today. And those could be achieved, I think, through very simple practices, often kind of organic and agroecology kinds of practices would maybe be the best way to begin to close those yield gaps using very appropriate and local technologies, keeping smallholders on the farm and empowering them to do better. That's something a lot of our panelists will talk more about later, I'm sure. We also have to get vastly more efficient with our modes of production, though. We use enormous amounts of resources, especially chemicals, and as I mentioned before, water to produce food. And the so-called Green Revolution um, produced more food, but using more chemicals, more energy, more water, and more machines. Now we're learning that that was maybe temporarily good for producing food, but long-term, very bad for the environment. 
So how do we produce more nutrition, but with less water, less chemicals? And that's something where, again, a lot of work can be done, both on the kind of high-tech and low-tech ends of the spectrum. And I think we have a lot to learn from organic and conventional agriculture and others that could be shared across the spectrum. Finally, though, it gets back to this issue, can we double the amount of food by mid-century? I don't believe that we can. Uh, you all remember Sarah Palin, right? I mean, who could forget, right? Um, you know, she would shout, drill, baby, drill, when asked about her energy policy. And I think our, our policies in the world have been kind of grow, baby, grow when it comes to food. But like energy, there is another side of the equation. You can yell, insulate, baby, insulate, or maybe don't throw that away. Don't throw that, well, it doesn't fit in a bumper sticker, but you know what I'm saying. Um, we have a supply side solution, but we also have demand side solutions. So we could feed 10 billion people probably today if we had no food waste and everyone were vegan. Well, that's not gonna happen right away, but clearly changing diets, biofuels, and food waste, eating away at the demand, making us smarter with the food we already grow might be a good solution. Uh, Emily Cassidy, who's in the audience, was a former student of mine who did this wonderful study showing how much of what we grow actually feeds people. A version of this also appears in the magazine. The green world feeds people. This is China, India, Africa, the Mediterranean, California, through most of Latin America. This is where crops are grown and fed directly to people. Rice, wheat, fruits, vegetables, roots and tubers, so on and so forth. The red world primarily feeds animals, and in some cases, cars. Um, we do eat those animals, but as Dennis mentioned before, it is not 100% efficient. So wherever you see red is a place you're getting meat, but you also maybe have an opportunity to get more food if we changed our diets and biofuel strategies a little bit. Where's there some room there? Furthermore, on top of this, whether it's meat or plant-based diets, we have about 30 to 50% of the world's food is never consumed, and that's in rich countries and poor countries. What can we do to reduce food waste, which is actually, I think, the biggest opportunity to address our food and environment challenges going into the future? So those were five kind of appetizers, no pun intended, to get some conversations started about where might we look for solutions to this kind of nexus of challenge between agricultural development, food security, and environmental sustainability. There are more, and this is the beginning of a conversation, certainly not the end. But what I want to leave you with is not the usual doom and gloom. You know, I'm an environmental guy, right? Uh, usually you don't invite people like me to parties um, because we will scare the hell out of you, right? So what I want to stress here is we do actually have the capacity right now to do a much better job with food security and the environment. We can address the future of food, and I think we can do that best when we have these conversations that bring us together rather than tear us apart, when we kind of combine our tools and strategies and look for commonality. But the good news is we can actually feed the world and sustain the planet. It's gonna require some new ways of thinking and I think new ways of collaborating, which I would argue is key. And it's really time for us to get to work and continue that conversation and take it out into the fields and into our kitchens and see what we can do. Thanks very much.